Good morning, real life. Uh, we're glad that you came this morning. We say that every week, but we mean it. And we would love to have you stand up and praise the Lord together with us this morning on this beautiful sunshiny day. Woo! And it's not great just because it's sunny. It's just great because Jesus is alive, right? And he saves. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Hope is here, shout the news to everyone, it's a new day, peace has come, Jesus saves, mercy triumphs at the cross, love has come to rescue us, Jesus saves. Hope is here, what a joyful noise we'll make, as we join with him. Please be seated. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys? Is it still beautiful out there? Spring is here. Yes. Yeah, that means someone just shut the lights. They must not like spring. 
Hey, a couple things for you. If you're new here, I'm Gene. Get to serve as one of the pastors here. We're glad that you're here this morning. Um, in the bulletin pack, you'll find your sermon notes and a connection card. If this is your home church, name and phone number, if you'd stick that on the connection card. On the back side is a place to put any prayer requests that you have. We pray for those every week. In the seat back in front of you, you'll see a blue card. If you turn your connection card in now, and then during the sermon, you're like, man, I just need, I need some prayer for this, whatever this thing is that you got going on. You can write those on the blue cards and turn those in, and we pray for those also. Let me tell you about a couple of announcements that are coming up. First uh, Sunday of May, May 2nd, is our membership class. It's a class that we do every month to find out what we believe in as a church and how we live those beliefs out together. So we'd love to, to have you come be a part of that to learn what it means to be the church, not just go to church. And then next Saturday, the 24th, we are having a shred day. So what they're doing is they're bringing one of these huge shred trucks. It's going to park on the property for three hours next Saturday. And so bring, I, we've had calls from people. Um, can I bring a truckload of stuff? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just uh, just paper. We don't want to shred anything thing living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to use that joke. It didn't work. <laughs> I, I don't have any more jokes either, so you're lucky. Um, so shred day next Saturday, and this is a shred day for the community. So um, apparently banks typically do this, um, you know, in a community, and there haven't been many in the last couple years because of COVID. So love for you to let your friends know about this. You can share it on Facebook, and it's open to everyone. So that's going on, and then we've got uh, uh, Bible study fellowships meeting here tonight for the men. Men's breakfast is coming up on the 1st. Uh, lots of different things in the bulletins to let you know about what's going on. Cool? You guys good? Yeah. yeah. I... Okay. 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 I like it. We're going to get fired up this morning, so we're going to pray. And we're going to ask God to speak to us through the rest of our worship service and through the Word when we get into it. So 11 a.m., you guys have had time to sleep in. So get your, uh, during this worship set, kind of stretch out if you have to. And we're going to get after it today, okay? So please join me as we pray. Father God, thank you for being good. Thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus. Thank you for the blood that washes us clean. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who regenerates our hearts, who gives us a new life. Lord, I pray for each person here that whether they are feeling super close to you today or they're wondering if you even see them or maybe they're even walking in rebellion against you, I pray, God, you would meet each of them where they are. You would show them their need for you. You would show them that you are enough for every need that they have. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would work on and in their life. God, you are, you are so good. I pray we'd experience your goodness today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. And, uh, stand and join us as we continue to worship. Yeah. the world, but it couldn't fill me, a man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough, and you came along and put me back together. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. 
Is he good? Yeah, is he God? Is he almighty? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's just praise his name at the top of our lungs. Two, three. Good, good God almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. And I can't count the times I've called your name some broken showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around yeah ain't no way you'll ever let me down good God almighty I hope you'll find me praising your name no matter what comes cause I know where Keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. 
the morning, praise him in the noontime, praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me.
have kids? <laughs> Bye. Bye. These guys got groupies. That's cool. So um, we are going to be continuing our series through the book of Philippians. If you're new with us, we've been working through the book of Philippians for some weeks. And uh, John Cook preached last week, and didn't he do a good job? Yeah, come on, didn't he do a good job? You guys got to work with me today, okay? All right, 9 a.m., they were a little bit quiet, but it's early, so they have an excuse. But y'all, right, you've had time to warm up. So um, we're going to talk about hope today, okay? It's a big subject, and one that we are in desperate need of. You know, with uh, kind of the 2019, 2020, 21, the pause that was COVID and all of that junk and all of the, you know, all of the, the stuff that the media is trying to pour into our minds to make us afraid, all of the disappointment that some of us have been experiencing in our life, hope is of short supply. And one of the things we're going to discover is what you put your hope in, or rather, who you put your hope in makes a difference. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a moment, we're going to pray, ask that God would speak to us, and then we're going to watch a video together that will hopefully kind of help set the context a little bit for our conversation. So please join me as we just ask that God would speak to us. Father God, we need to hear from you. Um, Lord, each person regardless of where they are, regardless of how tired they are, regardless of the distractions in the room. I ask, God, that you would speak to us, that you would show us your heart for us. You would compel us, God, to trust you and to take steps with you. I ask, God, that you would help me to communicate uh, your word clearly, but more importantly, that it would be received with the power that you originally wrote it in. Lord, we love you. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Watch this video with me. you have hope? I have hope always. Why? Why? Why not? It doesn't do you any good to sit around and whine and moan and hope. It's got to get better. Things will get better. Jobs will come back. Stuff will happen. What kind of hope are you talking about? Do you have hope? Yeah. Why? Because I believe that God gives you hope and faith. Hope? Yeah. That's all I got, really. <laughs> Do you have hope? Do I have what? Hope. Hope, yeah. Why? Because I'm living in America. What do you hope for? Well, I'm going to be 80. I hope for another five. OK. When you lack hope, how do you get it back? How do I get it back? Think about all the past good times I had. Where does hope come from? Where does it come from? Believing. Believing in? What? Most anything that's been good. Hope comes from uh, within. You gotta have, uh, I guess, faith. Faith in humanity. All right, go ahead and ask me a question. Okay. Do you have hope? Uh, not really, no. Why not? I just live every day like it's the last. Um. I've had a lot of loss in the last three or four years. Yeah. Did you have more hope before that, you think? Uh, not really. No. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a depressive kind of guy. Okay. I take pills. Okay. <laughs> when you lose hope, how do you get it back? 
The sack's gone for it back. Do I have hope? Yeah, I got hope. Because you could be in a hopeless situation and, there, and there's always a time for hope. I mean, it's just around every corner. Do I have hope? Oh, yes. Why? Lord Jesus Christ. How does, the, how does he give you hope? Faith, knowing that it's gonna, you, everything's going to be okay, being certain of that. How are you certain of that? By faith. That's what. That's what. That's how the ancients. Uh, that's how the ancients pleased God. Is by faith. So when you when you lack faith, how mm -hmm. do you find it? How do you find when hope? When you lack faith, then it's hopeless. The only thing you know then is what what, what you can see, what you what you can uh, um, uh, feel, or 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 you know what your five senses tell you. You're just a sensible person, but sens sensible people don't make it. <laughs> You know, hope is is one of those things that's kind of hard to describe, but you know when it's not there. You know when you don't have it. And we use that word a lot, right? We, we talk about hope all the time. I've got a definition in the top of your sermon notes that I think I got from Marion Webster. It's an expectation or belief in the fulfillment of something desired. It's this idea that things are going to be better, uh, especially compared to where you are right now. And we use the word a lot, right? Man, I, I hope this steak <laughs> turns out, right? That's short-term hope. I hope that girl says yes, right? I hope, my, I hope, I, I hope we get married and our marriage is going to be awesome. I hope I get that job, right? I hope that person, I hope that conversation with that person goes well. There's a lot of different things. I hope I get that car. There's a lot of different things we put our hope in. And I, and I want to I wanna ask this question. You ever put your hope in something and had it turn out better than what you hoped for? Okay, a couple of you have. Way more than any of the other services, by the way. You ever put your hope in something and been disappointed at how it turned out? Yeah, a lot more heads nodding, right? A couple of those ideas, do you have hope? Yep, what do you put your hope in? Humanity. That's awesome, until humans let you down, right? What do you, put your, what do you put your hope in? He goes, well, my hope is basically in hope. That one guy said it's around every corner, so I put my hope in hope. That's awesome, but what does that even mean, right? And so one of the things that, that I want to talk about this today is, is where do we get our hope and a hope that lasts? One of the things that I think is a, is a, a challenge for us is that when we think about hope, we need to think about hope in a big picture or eternity. One of the things about young men is they're not exactly always known for wisdom or long-term thinking. Okay, One of the most famous sayings of a young man is, hey, watch this, on their way to the ER. Right? And so we're, 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 I'm asking you this morning to take a little bit bigger picture, a little bit bigger picture into what the... The, the bigger story that we're a part of, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Right? He created the heavens and the earth. We, we, we read in creation in Genesis 1 that he creates, uh, creates the earth, he creates light, he, he creates, uh, uh, takes the, 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 the water and separates it from the sky, he creates plants, he creates animals, and then his ultimate creation was man. Out of dirt he made man. And in, in every day that God created, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good, until he made man, and then he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And, and, he, and he creates woman. And he's got this people, his ultimate creation, built to be in relationship with God. Now, that relationship had an order. God said, I have all authority because I've created everything. The man and woman had a job to do, right? They were to subdue and, 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 and take care of the garden that they were put into, they were to thank God and, and, and realize that their providence, that their supply comes from him. And they were, so, so that was their job. And, and then they were also supposed to walk in obedience to him because he had all authority because he created everything. And in the middle of garden comes temptation. Satan comes to the woman and he says, because God had told them, oh, by the way, there's a trees in this garden. You can eat from all of them except this one tree called the tree of good and evil. 
and the Satan comes to the woman and tempts her. The same temptation you and I face all the time. Did God really say that you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? Nope, the woman said. God said we can eat of all the trees except this one. We can't eat from it or even touch it. He said if we do, we'll die. You won't really die. What's going on is God is holding out on you. God knows if you eat of this tree, you will be like him, knowing good from evil. The woman looked at the fruit, saw that it was good to eat. She ate from it and gave some to her husband who was right there with her. And that, in that disobedience, the destruction and, and pain and suffering, this thing called sin that we experience today comes into the earth. The Bible says, through one man came sin. And, and through that one man, death spread to everyone because everyone has sinned. And it causes a separation between us and God. And and, and in fact, sin spread so fast through that first family that their kids, one of them killed the other one. And then we've got this amazing story where if I were God, I would have just given up on humanity at that point. But even in Genesis 3, we see that that God has a plan to to, to make things right. In in, in Genesis 3, he talks about this one that's going to come, born of a woman. And then we see this story play out in the Old Testament, where God calls a people to himself. He starts with a man by the name of Abraham. And he goes to Abraham and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a people group out of you. I'm going to create a nation out of you. And through that nation, all of the world will be blessed. The problem was Abraham was old. And his wife was old, and they had no children. But through the miraculous power that is God, they end up having a child. And through the, the lineage of that child comes this nation called Israel, And God did amazing things with this nation called Israel. He rescued them out of slavery. He led them through the desert. They're in the desert. Bread comes out of heaven for them. Water comes out of rocks for them. He defeats other armies that came against them. As as he fought for them, he even gave them this land called the promised land. He said, I'm going to give you this land, but there's a problem with this land. Other people live in it, and they're not excited to leave. But God said, don't worry. I will lead you in battle. Now, at the same time that we've got Israel, we've also got these men that God would send called prophets, and they would speak for God. And one of the things that would constantly tell Israel is, Israel, quit straying after these other gods that you tend to want to worship, but turn back to the living God. They they would come and yell over and over again, repent, 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 turn away from your sin. Turn away from these other gods. Turn to God. Trust him. But like us, well, like people at other churches, I'm sure we don't do this. Like us, right? They would, they would, they would stray back and forth over and over again. And, and I got to thinking about when you read the Old Testament, we've got these prophets, and then we've got 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I was thinking about a mom. You know how your mom, you, you, you keep messing up and your mom's yelling at you, right? You're in trouble, you're in trouble, quit that, quit that, and then mom gets quiet, and you're like, what's coming next? Maybe your mom wasn't like my mom, but I knew what was coming next was going to be really, really bad. I wonder what it was like for Israel. God's telling them through the prophet, repent, 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 and then for 400 years it's quiet. That's the world Jesus comes into. And Jesus comes, one of the amazing things about Christianity is all the other religions in the world say that you have to work your way to heaven, work your way to their God. But Christianity is different in that God came to earth. Jesus, born completely vulnerable as an infant in a manger, born of a virgin, born of a teenage mom, right? And he comes and he, and he lives this perfect life, sinless, because he's fully God, fully man. And, and in this conversation of hope that we're having this morning, we believe that hope, real hope, enduring hope, begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And here in Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, or 419, we see Jesus, and he calls some guys to come walk with him. They're called disciples. In fact, I think they were guys that would fit in our church because uh, we, we got like ready, shoot, aim Peter that just did stuff impetuously. 
right? But but he was he was a he was a he was a dude, right? I think he would have been a great miner or a great dirt biker because he did stuff before he thought. Um, we've got guys like uh, uh, you know Matthew. We've got the tax collector. We've got Luke, who's really smart. So we've got all of these different groups of people, and there were women that that that, that, that hung out with them also. And Jesus says, come follow me, invites them into relationship with him. But they understood that when he called them to be in relationship with him, there was an order to that relationship. They understood that Jesus was calling them as a rabbi, a, a teacher, and they were to be there as his disciples or his, his, his students, his active students. And so the lesson that Jesus taught them was amazing because he's God, he was able to teach them about who God is. He was able to show them the, the power of God as he lived that out. He walked on water. He fed a whole bunch of people with a couple fishes and a couple pieces of bread. He showed them how he cared about sick people. He would heal them. He showed them how he cared about poor people. He showed them how he, how he loved people who were caught in sin. Right? He, he didn't, he didn't um, uh, enable their sin. But he also said, like the woman caught in adultery, um, he said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging you, but go and sin no more. So they saw grace. They saw mercy. They saw him draw lines against the, the government people and the, the, the Roman soldiers. So they saw his power. They saw truth. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. They saw all of these things about Jesus. And then they saw God's ultimate love when Jesus went to the cross to be crucified for the forgiveness of sin. And they, and they didn't even realize it when Jesus' blood was being poured out, that that blood was being poured out to wash away their sin. It didn't make sense to them. And then three days later, they watched Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raised from the dead, overcoming sin and death, which they get to see the ultimate display of God's power. And a few days later, as they're standing at Mount Sinai, when Jesus is on top of the mountain in Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Go tell people about me as I've taught you about me. This makes sense to you this morning. Now, here's the thing about this. When, when we start looking at Christianity, one of the things that some of us tend to do is we tend to make it all about rules. Okay? And it's exhausting. And here's one of the things that Jesus does for us. Look at this in Matthew 11. And, and, and this is going to make sense in the conversation that we're having about hope today. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And he's talking about these people that you're trying to get your, get your, your way to God, move to God, please God, by following all the rules. And here's the deal. You can't. You can't do it. Anyone break one of the rules this morning? Okay, a whole bunch of you just did, because you're lying. Okay? I mean, if the Ten Commandments aren't enough, there's 613 other laws that were, that were brought up. Okay, if you need some more. Okay? Because we like to build laws. We like to build laws around laws. Okay? Here's what Jesus says. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavily burdened. And I will give you rest. So here's what he's saying for the context of the hope conversation. He's saying, don't put your hope in your ability to follow the law. Don't put your hope in your ability to be religious enough because you're going to blow it and it's tiring and it leads to death. Instead, he says, come to me. Put your hope in the completed work of Jesus on the cross. See, this is where this conversation starts. Is it, it, this bigger picture of hope that we're going to talk about. Because here's the thing. When I put my hope in me, I'm probably more disappointed than I am when I put it anywhere else on earth. Because I let myself down all the time. And I know I'm not alone because I know some of you. Right? Man, we disappoint ourselves all the time. But I can, he says, put my hope in, put your hope in me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
Jesus has come to me. This is what I love about the cross is we can come to Jesus and we can say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Jesus, I don't even know how to get through tomorrow, but I'm going to trust by faith, the faith that you give me, that you are going to lead me, you're going to guide me, and you just ask me to follow you. That's all. You know, Peter, one of those 12 disciples, Peter is the one that said when Jesus went to the cross, before he went to the cross, Jesus was like, man, I'll fight for you to the death, Jesus. And then like many of us, he disappointed himself. When Jesus was arrested, Peter split. Because Peter's like, man, if they're beating him, am I next? And so he leaves. So you can imagine the shame of letting down maybe your best friend. And he goes away. And one of the things I love about Jesus is after Jesus raises from the dead, Peter's one of the first guys he goes to. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yep. Do you love me? Yep. Do you love me? Three times he asked him, yep, you know I love you, Jesus. Okay, then feed my sheep. Jesus, you, you sinned. Jesus, you, you disappointed yourself. Jesus, you denied me. Or Peter, you denied me. This is Jesus talking to Peter. But Jesus says, man, I'm the God of second chances. And Peter, I want you to be with me. In fact, not only do I want you to be with me, but now you have a purpose in my kingdom to tell others about my goodness, to tell others about my grace, to tell others about my mercy, to tell others about my power that you experienced while you walked with me for three years. Peter's the one that walked with him on water for a few steps. Peter was there and saw Jesus raised from the dead. And so Peter later is writing a book. It's called First Peter, pretty original title. And he's writing to a group of people who are going through persecution. And I believe that he understood the persecution they're going to go through. They're going to go through persecution under the Roman emperor Nero. And if you've read much about uh, history, you understand that part of this persecution is he would take Christians and he would, he would attach them to wooden poles and he would turn them into streetlights by lighting them on fire. That's part of the reason that First Peter, it talks about the fiery trials they're going to go through. And here's what Peter tells them. Okay, he's going to tell them about hope. And, and you think about this. If, if they use their hope the way we often use our hope, what are they hoping for? I hope the fire is not as hot as it could be. Right? And Peter's saying, no, there's a hope you can put your, your trust in that's beyond that. So here's what it says. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm, I read that wrong. There's a baseball bat on the end of that one. So here's how Peter's going to write it. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Woo! I mean, this is what he's saying. See, we, we've, turned, we've turned Christianity, we've turned being followers of Jesus into like the frozen chosen. I might as well go to church. I can't lie anymore. I can't watch porn anymore. I can't, you know, I can't get drunk anymore and get in fights, right? We, we talk about all this, and Peter's like, you don't understand. We follow a God who, who knowing we were separated from him, knowing we were his enemies, he left heaven He came to earth. He went to the cross. He did everything that was necessary for us to be in relationship with him. He draws us. He saves us. He gives us faith. He loves us. When we're knuckleheads, he doesn't give up on us. Are you kidding me? We should be doing backflips down the aisles when we think about Jesus. When we see our friends that are dying, separated from Jesus, we should be, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. He is amazing, and he loves you. Are you with me? Boy, we get I get this jacked up all the time, right? Here's what he says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's why he's praising him. In his great mercy. Mercy. He gives us, he he doesn't give us what we deserve, right? In his great mercy, he has given us, given, given, given. We don't have to earn it. He has given us new birth. This idea of new birth is a word that Jesus told Peter or Nicodemus in in John chapter 3. He says, you must be born again. 
The Bible says we're spiritually dead without Jesus, and when we become Christians, we become born again, raised to eternal life. This is good news, right? We're going to start using that word born again and making it cool again because it's awesome. Born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you see that word living hope? It's a, it's a hope that's alive, and it's because our hope is in a person. Our hope is in Jesus Christ who overcame sin and death. The biggest problem you have ever will ever face, right? Your death is even bigger than taxes. And Jesus has defeated that. And he says if we put our trust in him, we will be raised to an eternal life forever and ever. Are you with? Come on, man. Okay? At least nod your head. Okay? I need to know that you're with me because this is good news. Look at this. Into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. Okay? I'm going to finish this, and then we'll talk about that. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. This isn't heaven. We want to make it heaven. We want to make it as comfortable as possible. We want to experience everything good. And there's guys on TV telling you, man, you can experience your best life today. If this is all there is, Jesus got ripped off. This isn't all there is. This is 60 years, 70 years, 90 years, 100 years. And it's broke. Sin entered the world. Put your faith in humanity, they will let you down. Right? Put your faith in a new car, it will break down. Put your faith in a new job. Guess what? That job, that job, God said because of sin, that job is going to be hard. Put your faith in that new diet, you'll gain your weight. Well, your body's going to be given up anyway. You're going to suffer. These people were looking at real suffering. But here's what he said. In the midst of that suffering, God, that, that word, it says he's given you an inheritance, eternal life that will be in heaven. But he says that you're shielded by God's power until the coming salvation. So coming salvation, there's this idea that Pastor Richard and I talk about all the time. That uh, it's called. Uh, so when we say yes to Jesus, when we receive him as Lord and Savior, we're saved. Then we talk about the sanctification process we're going through right now, where God's changing us to make to look more like Jesus. He's given us, uh, He's helping us to see the world more through Jesus' eyes. So we call that being saved. But one day when we go to glory, we'll truly experience salvation. Are you with me? So we say God's saving us, or God saved us. He's saving us, and He will save us. So it's that process we look through. It's just the way that He and I. It helps us to form it in our minds a little bit easier. But during that process, it says that, that no matter what happens to you here on earth, and it's going to be hard sometimes, God's protecting our soul. And that idea of this inheritance kept in heaven, through faith you are shielded by God's power into the coming of the salvation. The idea there is a fortress that God's protecting you in. I love that when I go through my hard stuff, Jesus says, I'll go through it with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm preparing a place for you. The Holy Spirit's given us a deposit for what's to come. You know, 1 Peter, a little bit later, he says this, but in your hearts, revere. He, he's talking about suffering in 1 Peter 3. And, he, and he's talking about not only suffering for when you mess up, but sometimes you're going to suffer when you do good. And he said, don't worry about it. It'll be hard. But don't worry about it. You've got an example that went before you. His name's Jesus. But also he says here, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Man, my hope's not in this world. This world's broke. This stuff's going to wear out. I got to look higher. I got to put my hope in Jesus because he says he's all powerful. I've experienced his power. He says he's not going to give up on me. Right? That's why I'm constantly yell, yelling at you to read the Bible. You need to know God's heart for you. 
Right? God helps those who help themselves. What happens when you're helpless? He doesn't help you then? By the way, that's not Bible. God specializes in helping us when we're weak. God specializes in giving us answers when we don't know the answer. Right? So look at this. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keep a clear conscience so that those who slander, uh, those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It's like press into Jesus, trust Jesus, follow Jesus, even in the midst of all the trials, even in the midst of the suffering. Now we're going to get to Philippians, what uh, what John preached about last weekend. The church in Philippi, there was this group of people, and they were saying, before you become a Christian, you have to become a Jew. Before you can... You can become holy and set apart. First, you've got to follow all the rules. You've got to circumcise yourself and all of these things. And Paul's saying, no, you're missing it. It's not about following the rules. It's all about Jesus. It's all about putting your trust in Jesus. It's all about believing what he says. It's all about following Jesus. Now, does that mean that we, 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 we that, 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 does, does, does Jesus give us rules? Yeah says, don't, don't lie, right? Don't look at women with lust in your eyes. Jesus says all of those things, right? But here's the deal. As we walk with him, as we receive his power, right? he, he enables us to do that, okay? Now, here's what he says. Here's what Paul says. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I want you to see what he doesn't say. I want to know about Christ. Man, I want to know Christ. yes to know the power of his resurrection resurrection, and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and somehow, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know him. I was thinking about this, and, and what, what's that analogy that I can use? And I, I was just thinking about Christy and I, my wife. So when we met, when, when we got married, we knew each other five months, and I was out of the country three of those months. So I knew about Christy when I married her, right? I knew some stuff about her. I knew she was like the most beautiful person I'd ever seen. It's like, wow. And she was nice to me, which was, wow. You know, made made me question her. (laughs) I got married and I barely, I I think I still, still had to write her phone number down on a piece of paper. You know, I couldn't remember it. I knew about her. But we've been married 29 years. And in 29 years, you know, I, I read about Paul saying, I want to participate in Christ's sufferings. And I am like, what in the world are you talking about, Paul? So are you, because we don't want to suffer. We don't like to suffer. But in the suffering is where we learn something about Jesus. We don't know that we need Jesus as a comforter until we need to be comforted. We don't know that we we don't experience Jesus as a protector until we need to be protected. We don't experience Jesus, Jesus' power until there's something that's bigger than we can handle on our own. Right? So here's what's happened in 29 years with Christy is we've suffered together. Right? We've cried together. Our hearts have been broken together. But there's something about that brokenness of heart that all of those walls go down. And you get to experience each other at a little bit deeper level. And I think it's like that in our relationship with God. Pain's a a teacher for us. We don't seem to learn the good things about God in the highlights. It's always in the depth of our pain that we see that we seem to learn about who God is. Right? And so Paul's like, man, I want to I want to know Christ. I want to become like him in his death. I want to attain to that resurrection from the dead because I put my trust in his completed work. And then here's what he says. I find this interesting that a guy that writes 13 books of the New Testament says this. He's talking about this maturity of knowing Christ. He goes, not that I've already obtained all this. but I, I, don't, I don't know him at the level that I want to know him yet or that I've already arrived at my goal But look what he does. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Right? I want to know Jesus. 
I love this. And brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Hey, you ever try to drive a car by just looking in the rearview mirror? Huh? Okay, you get custom body work that way, don't you? When you run into stuff. Yet some of us walk with Jesus that way. We spend all of our time looking at, at, our, at our past, at all of those things we've done wrong, or sometimes those things we've done right. And Paul says, here's the deal. You can't change what you did five minutes ago. Can't do it. But Paul says, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to look at your past disappointments and past hurts. I want you to look forward at Christ Jesus. I want you to enter into a relationship with Christ Jesus. I want you to put your hope in Christ Jesus because he is faithful and you can trust him. And here's the thing. When you put your hope in Jesus, you find out more and more how good he is. I was thinking about Christy. I could have like, what I wanted to do was keep looking at her from a distance because I'm that awkward, weird guy. But I would have never experienced, I would have always thought she was pretty and nice, but I would have never found out the depth of character that girl has. I would have never found out just how truly beautiful she is inside. I would have never found out how strong she is. I would have never experienced or watched her her compassion for people that are hurting. I would have never experienced her warmth on those days when the whole world feels cold. I would have never saw how true she is and how how honest she is and, and how integrity is like her number one character trait, even when it means she's got to knock herself off for something that she's done. I've never experienced her, her perseverance and, and, and just her grit at following Jesus and loving people. And if we don't press him to Christ and really try to know him, not just know about him, we'll never experience those things either. Now we finally get to the passage we're going to talk about today. In Philippians 3.15, he says, All of us then who are mature, some of your translations say perfect, that word means fit for a task. All of, you, the, all of us then who are fit for a task to take a, such a view of things. And, and look at this. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So, so, so I, I think about this. When we're walking with God through all of our experiences, I wish when we first became followers of Jesus our theology would be right. But it's just not that way. Right? We're... We're, we're constantly learning new things about God. Would you agree? Okay. Hopefully truer things about God. It's just like a relationship with a person. Right? I thought Christy, I thought she liked, I can't tell you. I found out she didn't. I found, I found out she actually likes vegetables. I was like, that's weird. Um, we find those things out about God also. And so what he's saying here is keep your minds open enough that God will teach you as he teaches, through, teaches you through his word. Okay, look at this. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. So this idea, live up to what we've already attained. He gives us a picture of walking as a soldier. This is living an intentional life. Living a life on purpose. Living a life. So it says we're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's actually living a life that Jesus would have us live. Okay, most of us go through life like a pinball bouncing off whatever's out there instead of, okay, this is what Jesus has said to me. This is how Jesus wants me to live. I've been given his Holy Spirit that empowers me to be who he says I am. I'm going to do the best I can to love people. I don't want to love that person. But Jesus says I can. Jesus says he's given his spirit to do that. Jesus says I need to do that. So I'm going to intentionally try to love this person. Does this make sense to you this morning? There's temptation in my life, and we all have temptation, and we all know what our temptations are. So guess what? If, if my temptation's alcohol, I'm not going to go hang out at the bar for lunch. If my temptation's pornography, I'm not going to get on the, the computer without some kind of screen thing to, to keep me from going into pornography. If my temptation's food, I'm not going to go to the buffet, right? Whatever your thing is. Does it make sense? I'm going to live my life on purpose. Okay, if my temptation's lying, I'm going to ask God, help me to be truthful in every situation, including the white lies that don't seem to matter. 
okay? So, let us live up to what we've already obtained. Then he goes, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. One of the reasons we meet in community together, both in a, a large group and in our small groups, is sometimes I need a model of what it means to follow Jesus. So if the Bible says, um, you lo- love one another, love's not my natural thing. So I'm so grateful that God has given us people in our church that are really good at loving people. Because then what I can do is I can look at their example and say, that's how you love people, okay? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that example. I may even ask them, hey, can you teach me how you love people? This is that openness that needs to exist in the church, right? Uh, Jesus said, I came not to serve, but serve and give a life as, as a ransom for many. We've got people in this church that are really good at serving people. Yesterday, we had a bunch of people. We did a, a memorial service for Bert Minnick, and he was one of those guys that just, you just love Bert. And one of the things I loved about our church is as I sat here yesterday with our church full of visitors, I just watched those of you that were here, I watched the way you love people yesterday. And it's amazing. I can't love people the way you do. But watching you comfort people who are grieving and watching you talk to people that just needed to be listened to, I was like, man, you guys give a beautiful picture of who Jesus is. Right? Um, Service, when it comes to serving people, Jeff Smith, he's one of those guys that loves to serve people. So here's what I'll do. Hey, Jeff, next time you go on a surf project, I want to go with you, and I'm going to ask him questions. Casey McKinney, our maintenance guy, I've watched, I've seen him up to his waist in someone else's septic tank. It's not because he likes to smell. It's because he knows Jesus put me on this planet to serve this people. They need to be served that way. Man, I get messed up in my head that sometimes. Casey, help me understand why you're doing that, right? Okay? Joy. Margie Curry, if you know Margie, she is so full of joy, I can barely spell joy. Margie, help me understand why you're so joyful, because I know her life hasn't always been easy. So Paul says, follow the example of those who are mature, right, that you've seen them do that. Now, here's the thing. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And a little bit earlier, Paul said, I haven't, I'm not fully mature yet. So he's not saying, follow every part of my life. That those things in my life that you see that line up with who Jesus is and what Jesus says, follow those examples. Okay. But, and then he gives us another, uh, another deal here. He said, For I have told you before and now to tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is their destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So he's saying there's two groups of people in the church. There's those that are pressing into Jesus, growing to be mature, follow their example. There's others, though, that live as enemies of the cross. And he said that there's destruction coming for them. He says these are people that are just focused on their appetites, their sensual appetites, They're not thinking about eternity. They're not thinking about Christ. They're not thinking about anything else. He says their glory is in their shame. He says things that should be sinful, they're actually celebrating and glorifying those things. And then he says destruction's coming for them. But here's the thing that it says. See see what he says? He says, with tears in my eyes, it should break our heart. But we should also, and and I struggle with this, but when we, when we watch brothers and sisters walking in sin, should we just let it idly go by? Well, they'll learn. We've got we to gotta warn them. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sin makes me stupid. I don't think I'm the only one. And sometimes I need a brother or sister that can speak into my life. But here's the deal. I'm probably not going to hear it from someone I don't know. And so it tells me, man, I I need, we need relationship with Christ and we need relationship with each other. I need people that are willing to look me in my eye, that are willing to be brave, to say, Gene, the direction you're going leads to death and you can't even see it yet. 
Because we're not as wise as we think we are sometimes. He says, their mind is set on earthly things. He goes, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. There's this weird, tempt- there's this weird uh, we, we, as followers of Jesus, we have dual citizenship. Spiritually, we are set in heaven with Christ, but physically we live here on earth. It says, we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his and his glorious body. One day, these bodies are going to wear out, but when we leave earth and we go to heaven, we're going to get new bodies and they're going to be awesome. That's that idea of being transformed. I want to talk about that power that he talks about. And i got to be careful here because this idea of power has been misused, I think. So what power is this that Christ subjects all things to himself. Well, we know it's the power of God because Jesus is God. This is the power that in eternity past looked into the darkness during creation and said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the power that called trillions and trillions of stars into existence out of nothing and told those stars, you stay there. And you know where those stars are today? Right where Jesus put them. This is the power that parted the Red Sea. This is the power that caused manna to fall from heaven. This is the power that made the walls of Jericho fall down. This is the power that preserved Daniel alive in a lion's den. This is the power that enabled a virgin to conceive and give birth. This is the power that subdued demons. This is the power that calmed the sea. This is the power that healed lepers. This is the power that raised the dead. This is the power that sustained Jesus as he hung on a cross for your sins. This is the power that took hold of your life and cleansed you from your sins. Uh, This is the power that gave you his spirit to dwell within you. This is the power that one day will appear again and come and destroy God's enemies and deliver God's people and raise and transform our bodies to be like his own. This is the power of Christ in which we place our hope. How far does this power extend? What is the scope of its rule and reign? Paul says all things are subject to him. And here's the, th- here's the hard part for us because we don't see it yet, right? Because his enemies, God's enemies, and our enemies still exist. But well, here's what you have to know, and by faith we believe this, that they are not winning now and they will never prevail The power of Jesus Christ not only will be experienced in the future, but it can be experienced now. That power is manifest or experienced when we preach the gospel. That power is manifest or experienced when sinners come to Christ when they're saved. That power is manifest or experienced when people humbly submit to suffering and persecution. That power of Christ is seen when we don't seek vengeance or retaliate or return evil for evil but rather we entrust ourselves to him who is able to judge justly. The power of Christ is seen when a suffering saint refuses to recant his faith, but instead remains somehow entranced by the beauty of the risen Christ and the face of ugliness in the world. And although you don't always see that power at work, I assure you that the power of Christ keeps every proton and electron and glue on and quark precisely where they must be so that our universe can continue to exist. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, when talking about Jesus, it says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The author of Hebrews says this about Jesus. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And we can rejoice in the duration of his power. In uh, Revelation, it says there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. How many of you woke up this morning hurting? It's hard to be happy or joyful or have hope when you hurt. But the hope we have is that with our new bodies, our glorified bodies, there'll be no fatigue or pain or sickness. 
or chronic aches or itches. It will only be pure physical and spiritual pleasure as we bask in the glory of God. In the age to come, there will be new faculties of mind to think and to comprehend the, maj the majesty of God. There will be new senses that enable us to see and feel and hear and taste and uh, the, the limitless beauty of goodness of who Jesus really is. There will be no bodily lusts that defile your heart. There will be no physical fatigue to cloud your mind. No wicked impulses against which you must fight. No dullness of spirit to hold you back. No lethargy of soul to slow you down. No weakness of will to keep you in bondage. And no lack of energy to love someone else. No absence of passion to pursue what is holy. And that last one absolutely appeals to me because some days I just want to want to pursue holiness. So what's the practical benefit of thinking about these things? Why does it matter to us today? Why am I encouraging you to fix your eyes and your hearts on the heavens from which Jesus will return? Because this is what gives us the power today to not give in to temptation. It's what gives us the power today to not lose hope even when we disappoint ourselves because of our shortcomings compared to the holiness of God. In fact, here's what John puts it. We know that when he, Jesus, appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. He goes on and says, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Here's the reality. Some of you feel trapped by almost unbearable pain by a circumstance that you can't control. And maybe my hope today is that the only thing that will keep you from suff suffocating in despair is the thought that what you're experiencing and suffering through now is not the final word. It's never the ultimate. That pain, that suffering will not prevail. Whatever enemies are making life miserable for you, they will be defeated in the day of Christ. Whatever bodily pain won't go away today, eventually it will. And Jesus will defeat every opponent. He will reveal every lie. And Jesus will vindicate every truth. And my hope for you today is that putting your, your hope in the completed work of Jesus Christ will enable you to never quit. To keep trusting, to keep walking, Keep believing that Jesus is who he says he is. The world's hard. It's dark. It's probably going to get darker. But we are not without hope. We can put our trust in Jesus Christ that as he rose from the dead and kept that promise, the next promise he's going to keep is when he returns in glory to do battle, to put everything under his feet, to make everything right in this world. Now, Here's the thing about this power, though. This power is not just a future expectation for in heaven. This power can be experienced today. In Ephesians chapter 3, when Jesus talks, or when Paul writes about this power, he's talking to a group of people. There's these different groups of people in this church, the Jews and the Gentiles, and there's no way they should be getting along at all, yet God has taken those two people and made them one. And it's because of the love of Christ that they received. They're now taking that love and they're expending it on each other. They're loving one another. They're giving grace to one another. They're forgiving one another. They're encouraging one another. They're serving one another. They're praying for one another. They're, 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 they're reminding each other of where their hope is in. And he says that that, that that love that's being expended is a beautiful picture of this power that we receive from Christ. And here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Now to him, now to Jesus, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that's true about Jesus? Man, we believe it, but isn't that hard to live that way? I believe Jesus can do these things. I believe he can heal. I believe that even when he doesn't, he can comfort. 
Look at this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He said that power is at work within us. So then, is that power, the hope of the power of Christ, is that at work in your heart right now? Are you experiencing that encouragement that comes from putting your hope in Jesus? Now, if not, I think it starts, that first step to experiencing that is responding to the first invitation we started the sermon with when Jesus said, hey, come, follow me. Come, trust me. There's no hope available apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. There just isn't. And in Jesus, when you walk with Jesus, it doesn't mean the world's suddenly going to become rainbows and butterflies. It's hard. But what it does say is when you walk through the hard things that everyone walks through, when you experience the disappointment, when you experience the grief, when you experience the pain, it says that Jesus walks with you. That Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus will give us his grace, and he will give us his comfort, and he will, he will love us as we walk through that. And so I just want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus and to continue to say yes to Jesus in every, every circumstance. So here's what we're going to do today is I want to give you a moment to just spend some time talking to Jesus. I know you guys are incredibly busy. I know that, you know, with the change in weather and the sunshine coming out, sometimes all, all we do is add to our to-do lists. And sometimes we get so busy with kids and jobs and sometimes recreation or even walking in sin, if we're honest, that we don't sometimes just have time to stop and take a deep breath and remember that Jesus is alive, to remember that Jesus sees us, to remember that Jesus knows us, to remember that, that his grace that raised, Jesus, that, that raised uh, Lazarus from the dead. That grace is still available to us today. That power that parted the Red Sea, that power is available to us today. That mercy and that. So I just want to ask you to take a moment and just start having a conversation with Jesus. Maybe there's just a sin you need to confess to him today. Lord, would you help me? Maybe, maybe you've never said yes to him ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe you just need to go to him and ask, Lord, would you save me? Would you forgive me of my sin? Would you help me, Lord, to turn away from my soul-filled life to follow you? Lord, I want to I I experience you. Maybe you're in a place right now where you're just hurting. Maybe it's physical pain. Maybe you're hurting for someone. Maybe there's a broken relationship. Would you pray for that? Lord, would you help me today? Maybe there's someone you know that doesn't know Jesus. Would you pray for them today? I love to close my eyes and use my sanctified imagination and imagine their face as I pray for them. Lord, would you show your grace to them? Lord, would you use me to tell them about how good you are? I'm going to ask you to pray for Jesus' church also. This church, other churches in the Silver Valley that follow Jesus. If you think of them by name, if you know their pastors, elders, or the people at that church, that they'll stay, they'll, they'll, they'll walk in the righteousness of Christ together. Just spend some time praying. While you're praying, I'm going to ask the servers, they're going to start passing out the elements of communion. And if you're new with us today, if you're a follower of Jesus, we look at you as family. And this is kind of our family meal. So as they pass out the elements, we'd love if you take one. The two cups have a piece of bread and a cup of juice. They represent the body and blood of Jesus. Just hold them. We'll take them together in a moment. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you can just let it go by if you'd like. But take the cup, hold it, spend some time praying. We'll take them together in just a moment.
will be a day when your hope is tested. Maybe it's today. Maybe you're going through something right now that you're like, I, I just don't know how this can be any better. I just don't see a way out of this. In those moments, Jesus says, look a little higher. And look at me and know that I'm who I say I am. That I'm bigger than whatever you're facing. And, and my hope lasts into eternity. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and he says that I received from you what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take this together. Remembering the body of Jesus. The same way after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. And then Paul writes, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are proclaiming when we take that together that Jesus is alive and one day he'll come back to make everything right. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Lord, I believe that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you can turn our hearts and our minds toward you. And we pray you would do that, God. I pray that regardless of where people are with you, in the relationship with you, or as your enemies, I pray, God, that you, by your power, would turn us towards you to trust you and walk with you. Lord, I pray that some here just need to be encouraged today. They just need to, to be comforted, God. And I believe that you're a God of all comfort. I pray you would meet them in their pain. You would meet them in their suffering. Some are just tired, God. And I pray that those that are tired would find encouragement from you. And, and they would find a, a, a new courage in you to face tomorrow. We love you, Lord. And we pray all of this in your good name. Amen. We're going to sing one final song. We'd love it if you'd stand and sing with us. If you'd like to pray, there'll be some of us in the front here that would love to pray with you today.
together. Some of you are having a really good day right now, and some of you are going through things that are incredibly hard. 